In this video, you will learn about Warren Buffett, the world's greatest investor and one of the world's richest men, and how he made his first million dollars. At age 31, Buffett went from zero figures to seven figures. This video will cover the events, characteristics, and investments that were pivotal for Buffett to become successful at such a young age. But first, let's address a common misconception. Many popular videos within the field of investing in personal finance on YouTube cover Buffett's most recent moves in the stock market. The idea is that whatever the world's greatest investor is doing, you should be doing too, right? Wrong. Managing a portfolio of companies worth hundreds of billions of dollars, as Buffett does at Berkshire Hathaway today, is a different game from managing a smaller net worth, say, $1,000 to $500,000. The smaller investor actually has some advantages, as we'll discuss. Our story begins in 1936 when Warren Buffett was just six years old. Despite having entrepreneurial role models in his father Howard and grandfather Ernest, Buffett had to earn his money through hard work. His early ventures included selling chewing gum door-to-door, -door, with a profit of two cents per pack, and selling Coca-Cola for a five-cent profit on a twenty-cent investment. Buffett remained focused on achieving significant financial milestones. He famously stated that if he hadn't amassed a million-dollar fortune by age 35, he would jump off the tallest building in Omaha. Fortunately, Buffett's journey took a different path, leading to his eventual success in the world of investing. Buffett's childhood was marked by a relentless curiosity, akin to that of a seasoned investor seeking an informational edge. For instance, he collected bottle caps to determine the most popular soda brand and recorded license plate numbers near a bank, showing an early inclination towards gathering valuable information. Buffett's fascination with numbers and statistics was evident from a young age. He once analyzed the lifespan of him composers compared to other composers, seeking to understand if religious affiliation had any impact, concluding that it did not. His voracious reading habit led him to discover the book, 1000 Ways to Make $1000, which likely influenced his early financial strategies. Buffett's journey to his first million dollars was paved with hard work, curiosity, and a keen eye for opportunity, setting the stage for his future success in the world of investing. Realized that if this book could keep its promise, this was everything he needed to make that first million. And perhaps it would be quicker than going door to door selling 50 million packs of chewing gums? The book conveyed an important message, never before had the times been so favorable for someone with little capital to start his own business. But you cannot succeed until you start. You must start today. By the way, this book was first published in 1936, and it was correct in saying that it was easier to start a business without much capital at that time than it had ever been before. But in today's age of software and the internet, I'd say it's at least 10x easier now than it was in the 1930s. But, just like the book says, you cannot succeed until you start. We've now come to the point where Buffett decided to make his first move in the stock market. Buffett's First Investment Thanks to his relentless efforts, Buffett had now amassed about $120. Before you scoff at that, consider that, due to inflation, $120 in 1941 is the equivalent of $2,125 today. At age 11, that is pretty impressive. Buffett had already understood the power of compound interest and he desperately wanted to get ahead of the curve. He knew that once that snowball of wealth started to roll, nothing would be able to stop it. Going pretty much all in, Buffett now bought his first few shares in the stock market. The company was called City Service, and he bought three of its preferred shares for a total of $114.75. The shares immediately dropped. Not only had Warren invested all of his hard-earned money, he had also convinced his older sister Doris to invest with him. Doris picked on Buffett every day in school, reminding him that her shares were falling in value. Buffett felt terrible. At one point, he got a chance to cash out at a $5 profit for both of them and so he did. It didn't take long for the city service preferred to soar to $202 a piece. Warren Buffett learned, at least, two valuable lessons from this experience. Firstly, 
do not fixate on what price you paid. Secondly, do not rush to grab a small profit. Considering that it took Buffett about five years to accumulate those first $120, you'd understand why he was grieving when he realized that he was sitting out on a $492 profit. Buffett's Motivation Howard Buffett, Warren's father, was elected a congressman to represent his state in Washington, and so, the Buffett family moved there in 1943. Warren didn't like it there at all and insisted on being sent back to Omaha to live with his grandfather Ernest. His wish was granted. On the weekends during this time, Buffett worked at his grandfather's grocery store. Buffett later said about this experience, I may have been the lowest paid person to ever work in the grocery business. I didn't learn anything, except that I didn't like hard, physical, work. Warren's grandfather Ernest was hilarious by the way. In addition to running a grocery store, Ernest dreamed of one day becoming an author. He had written a book which he decided to call, How to Run a Grocery Store and a Few Things I Learned About Fishing. Luckily, Warren's father, the stockbroker and congressman, had a greater influence on Warren than Ernest did. Buffett the Newspaper Boy Buffett's reunion with Omaha didn't last for long though as in late 1943, he was called back to his family in Washington. He still didn't like it. But he liked to earn money, and so he started to deliver multiple newspapers. Once again, Buffett showed his determination to get ahead of the curve. He was no longer earning pennies either. By the end of 1944, at age 14, he was the proud owner of $1,000, or $14,795 in today's money. This year, he also filed his first tax return. We can see that Buffett was quickly gaining momentum, increasing his income from the newspaper routes from $42 in July 1944 to $86 in November and December during the same. Buffett deducted his bicycle and wristwatch, which he knew was kind of questionable. He paid a total of $7 in taxes that year. By age 16, he was making $175 a month from his newspaper routes. To put that number in perspective, the average engineer in 1946 could expect to earn about $392 monthly. Even though I do not doubt that Buffett was quite efficient when delivering his newspapers, he was basically working a full-time job while in high school. You clearly can't have everything in life, and what Buffett had in his wallet, he lacked in the girls' department. Like many other boys before and after him, yours truly included, he decided that the answer to this dry spell must be to start on a weightlifting routine. Inspired by Bob Hoffman in his magazine, Strength and Health, Buffett bought a set of dumbbells and a barbell to keep in the family basement. He was disappointed, though, and said that no matter how many curls he did, his arms didn't become much larger. Doubling his money in a year, now at $2,000 at age 15, Buffett became the owner of a 40-acre farm in Nebraska for $1,200. In other words, he put 60% of his net worth into this stuff, quite a bold move. With smaller sums of money, you can afford not to diversify so much. Buffett shared the profits with the tenant farmer who worked there. Remembering the days at the grocery store, Buffett thought he had made a tremendous deal here. He didn't have to do any of the physical work himself. Warren sold the farm in 1950 at 2x the price he had paid for it, and in the meantime, he had received profits from the land for five years. Impressive stuff. One of the ideas in the book, 1000 Ways to Make $1000, stood out to Buffett. This was the idea of buying a scale and having people pay to weigh themselves. It wasn't specifically the weighing machines that Buffett was impressed with, but the exponential growth that could occur if the money was reinvested in buying new scales. If it took 30 days to buy the second scale with profits from the first one, it took just 15 days to buy a third one, 10 days to buy the fourth, 7.5 days for the fifth, and so on. Buffett never bought any scales. Perhaps he decided that it would be too difficult to collect the money, but he used the idea in forming his first business partnership with his friend Don Danley. They decided to buy pinball machines. The business plan looked like this, Warren would buy old pinball machines, 
fixer-uppers, at the price of $25. The new ones were $300, so the old ones would have a much greater return on capital. Don Danley would repair these machines. The machines would then be placed at local barber shops, and profits would be split with the barber. Warren and Don had to convince the barbers that repairing pinball machines was an art, truly difficult, so that the barbers wouldn't start to compete with the boys. Buffett and Danley quickly built up a small empire of machines, and everybody in high school knew about this at the time, so Buffett and Danley were the cool kids for a while. Buffett was able to sell this business for $1,200 before graduating from high school. It wasn't entrepreneurship that seemed the most alluring at the time, though. When Warren Buffett graduated from high school, he put future stockbroker under his picture in the yearly school book. Buffett attended Wharton for two years but left because he felt the curriculum wasn't practical enough. He then applied to Columbia Business School and was admitted. At Columbia, Buffett studied under Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing, and this experience would shape his investment philosophy for the rest of his life. Warren Buffett attended the University of Pennsylvania in 1947, reluctantly, as he felt it would slow down his progress, but he went because his father wanted him to. His favorite class at Wharton was Industry 101, which taught him about running businesses in major industries. After his father was not re-elected in 1948, the family moved back to Omaha, and Warren completed his college education at the University of Nebraska, focusing on accounting, which he considers the language of business. Despite being shy at fraternity parties, Buffett engaged in discussions about stocks, money, business, and politics. By age 19, he had read many books on investing, including New Methods for Profit in the Stock Market and Technical Analysis of Stock Market Trends, but had been led astray by trying to master technical analysis and candlestick charts, like many aspiring traders. In 1949, Benjamin Graham's book The Intelligent Investor was released, which had a profound impact on Buffett. He connected with Graham's ideas of intrinsic value, Mr. Market's irrationality, and the importance of a margin of safety. Buffett started studying individual companies extensively, reading Moody's and Standard & Poor's manuals, and analyzing hundreds of companies to build a mental library of stocks. He also learned from The Pink Sheets, a publication about smaller companies. Armed with Graham's teachings and his research, Buffett began investing in undervalued companies, starting with Geico in 1951, based on its growth potential and undervaluation. Warren Buffett made his first million through strategic investments in the stock market, focusing on smaller companies that were not heavily traded on stock exchanges. He recognized the potential in these less competitive markets and capitalized on it. Buffett's early academic career was not remarkable, but he was determined to succeed. Despite struggling in high school and college, he was driven by his entrepreneurial spirit, as evidenced by his refusal to give up his newspaper routes even when threatened by his father. After being rejected by Harvard Business School, Buffett discovered that his idol, Benjamin Graham, was teaching at Columbia Business School. He applied and was accepted, despite submitting his application late and without an interview. At Columbia, Buffett immersed himself in Graham's teachings, particularly his book, Security Analysis. Graham, a partner in the investment firm Graham Newman, taught using real-world examples, sometimes inadvertently revealing his firm's investment strategies. Despite this, Graham Newman outperformed the market, showcasing the effectiveness of Graham's principles. Buffett excelled at Columbia, becoming the first student to receive an A-plus in one of Graham's courses. He found his passion for investing and learned valuable lessons that would shape his future success. During his time at Columbia, Buffett learned about governmental employees insurance company, Geico, where Graham served as chairman. Buffett saw the potential in the insurance industry and would later become known for his investments in insurance companies, earning him the nickname, the insurance king. Buffett's early experiences and education laid the foundation for his future success as one of the most renowned investors in history. Warren Buffett's investment journey includes a pivotal moment involving his discovery of government employees insurance company, Geico, which would become his greatest investment. 
Buffett learned about Geico while at Columbia Business School, where he traveled to its headquarters in 1951 to learn more about the company and the insurance business. Despite initially planning for a brief meeting, Lorimer Davidson, an assistant to Geico's president, was impressed by Buffett's preparation and spent four hours discussing the insurance industry, Geico's market share, and its competitors. Buffett decided to invest heavily in Geico, putting 65% of his net worth into the company by the end of 1951. When Geico's stock rose 50% in 1952, Buffett sold his shares and switched to another insurer, Western Insurance Securities, which had a low price-to-earnings (P.E.) ratio. Buffett's decision was influenced by Western Insurance Securities' P.E. ratio, which caught his eye compared to Geico's higher ratio at the time. In addition to his investment success, Buffett's personal life also saw a significant turn. Despite facing difficulties in his romantic life, Buffett's sister set him up on a date with Susan, Susie, Thompson in the summer of 1950. Initially taken by another man, Susie's father disapproved of her suitor, leading to Buffett dating Susie and eventually marrying her in April 1952. Buffett considered his marriage to Susie the best investment of his life, highlighting the importance of personal relationships. During their honeymoon, Buffett brought along his reading materials, including the Moody's manuals, demonstrating his dedication to learning and investing even during personal milestones. In 1958, Buffett and Susie purchased their first home together, marking a significant step in their lives. Overall, Buffett's early investment in Geico, coupled with his personal relationships and commitment to learning, set the stage for his future success as an investor and businessman. Buffett promptly began referring to it as, Buffett's folly. He knew that he could earn much better returns in the stock market than what he could hope for from appreciation in housing prices. Consider that Buffett thought this was a stupid move even though the house only represented some 10% of his net worth at that point, not 500% like it does for most first home buyers today. After graduating from Columbia Business School in 1951, Buffett wanted to work for his favorite teacher investor, Benjamin Graham. He even offered to take the job without a salary. However, during this time, there was still some prejudice against Jews, perhaps especially on Wall Street, so Graham, who came from a Jewish family, had decided that he was only hiring Jews. Because of this, in 1951, Buffett returned to Omaha to work at his father's brokerage firm. He didn't feel too good at this job though. As a broker, you must sell. Buffett felt like a man selling prescriptions. He didn't earn based on how good his tips were but based on turnover. In other words, he wasn't looking to cure his patients, just to sell them as many pills as possible. He also thought he didn't get the respect he deserved from his clients. And to be honest, who could blame them? Not every 21-year-old working at their father's brokerage firm is a wonder child. In January 1952 Buffett completed a Dale Carnegie speaking course. He still keeps a certificate of this on his wall in his Omaha office and has said about the course, that's the most important degree that I have. Long before the course, Buffett had read Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and he knew that if he were to get anywhere in this world, he would need to learn how to handle people. And how to speak well in front of an audience. To practice his skills, he started teaching an evening course in investing and personal finance at the University of Nebraska. He enjoyed emulating his idol Benjamin Graham. Buffett was teaching until 1958, although he was at three different universities during this period. In 1956, he was teaching a class called, Investment Analysis for Men Only. I understand where Buffett came from, but I'm glad to hear that he later decided to expand to also teach a course called, Investing for Women. From 1951 to 1954, Buffett sent stock tips to Graham Newman and occasionally dropped by their office. It took him three years before Graham changed his mind about Buffett's employment. But finally, Warren became Graham Newman's first employee with a non-Jewish background. Buffett arrived in New York, where the Graham Newman office was situated, in August 1954, a whole month before his actual starting date. His salary was $1,000 per month. 
He quickly became the golden boy of the company through his wits and absolute dedication to stocks. In 1956, he was offered to take over the fund when Graham wished to retire, and when he didn't accept the offer, Graham Newman decided to shut down. Without Graham, Buffett thought that he might as well go his own way. At age 26, Buffett had accumulated something like $174,000, and he had now moved back to Omaha from his two years in New York. He talked about retiring as he knew that his family could sustain on something like $12,000 per year. Apparently, Buffett thought that investing and handling a few other people's money equaled retirement because that's exactly what he chose to do at this point. On May 5, 1956, when Buffett was 25 years old, he formed Buffett Associates, Limited, an investment partnership similar to Graham Newman. It was much smaller though, consisting of only seven partners among family and friends. Buffett was the general partner, meaning that, the seven limited partners had contributed a total of $105,000. Buffett himself added just $100. There are some conflicting data about the fees of the partnership, and it seems a few of the most popular books about Buffett have got this wrong. The deal was not that the limited partners would be guaranteed a 4% interest and that Buffett and the partners then split the profits. In truth, during the period when he operated multiple partnerships between 1956 to 1961, there were various deals to opt for, as stated in Buffett's partnership letter in July 1961. In 1962, when he combined all of these separate partnerships into a single larger one, the deal was a 6% interest, and Buffett took one quarter of all profits, as stated during Berkshire Hathaway's annual shareholder meeting of the year 2000. When we put them together, we settled on the 6% preferential, with a quarter of the profits over that, with a carry forward of all deficiencies. Nobody was guaranteed anything on them. There were some additional interesting rules. The limited partners could basically only add or withdraw money once each year, during the month of December. Buffett didn't want people in and out of the partnership. Moreover, he wasn't going to tell them anything about what he invested in, as Buffett didn't want people to bid up the prices of the stocks he was interested in. Because of this secrecy, some people in Omaha came to think that Buffett was running a Ponzi scheme. Those that were dubious about Buffett's skills and trustworthiness were missing out. During the period 1957 to 1961, Warren managed to beat the Dow Jones Industrials by as much as 16% per year, or a compounded 177%. Even after Buffett's fees, this allowed the limited partners to beat the index by an average of 10.2% per year, a compounded 107%. Buffett's competencies as an asset manager got more attention, and by the end of 1961, he managed a total of 10 different partnerships, plus he also had one with his father. Buffett and the cigar but so, how did he achieve these types of returns? At Columbia, Graham had taught Buffett an investing strategy which they referred to as, buying cigar butts. Such stocks were soggy, unloved, and often just thrown away, but they were typically useful for at least one more, puff. Okay, enough with the analogies. The cigar butt strategy meant buying cheap companies, really cheap ones. Their stocks were typically trading at very low price-to-earnings ratios and or at a low price compared to cash and assets. These mispricings would often correct themselves in a few months or perhaps a year or two when the stocks lit up, and this represented the final puff. Buffett would then sell the company and buy something that was cheaper. Buffett was screening through resources such as the before-mentioned Moody's manuals, the pink sheets, and the national quotation book for small companies which people in the stock market had forgotten about. Their market caps were often between $1 to $10 million. Two important examples of cigar butts that Warren Buffett bought early on in his career were Sanborn Map and Dempster Mill. Sanborn Map was a company delivering detailed information of different structures in cities all over the United States, showing, among other things, the diameter of water mains underlying streets, the locations of fire hydrants, and the composition of roofs, information which was of interest to a fire insurance company. 
Buffett put up 35% of his partnership's money during the period 1958 to 1960. In 1958 you could buy a share of the company for $45, while it held $65 worth of blue-chip securities in its balance sheet. The business wasn't performing great, as insurance companies were trying new techniques for their underwriting, but it was still cash flow positive and came with a dividend. And at this price, essentially, you got the Sanborn business for free. In addition to this, you were getting $20 worth of blue chip stock. Not a bad deal, and Buffett earned about 50% on this investment over two years. Dempster Mill Manufacturing was a manufacturer of farm implements and water systems. Buffett started acquiring shares in 1956, although most of them were bought in 1961 when the company was selling at $30 per share and was breaking even on profits. It had earned good money in the past, but not anymore. What made Buffett salivate was the fact that the company had $75 per share in book value. He realized that, could this value be unlocked, the current share price would allow for great returns. Buffett Associates acquired 73% of the company at an average of $28 per share and used about 21% of its assets to take control over the company and sell off assets to make it more efficient. Eventually, Buffett managed to sell Dempster to an acquirer in 1963 for $80 per share, or a 185% return. If you wish to screen for similar companies today, I suggest using either Joel Greenblatt's Magic Formula, Tobias Carlyle's Acquirer's Multiple, or Benjamin Graham's NetNet stocks. It's clear that Buffett was fully occupied in his quest of accumulating wealth. He didn't spend very much time with his kids, and when he did, he was often somewhere else mentally. On a vacation in California, he took the kids to Disneyland. While they were running around and having a grand time on their own, Buffett just sat on a bench reading. It's also clear that Susie sustained Buffett, both emotionally, and practically in their household. Her husband didn't have too many needs, but she saw to it that they were always fulfilled, a light bulb in his reading lamp, some Pepsi in the refrigerator, yes, Buffett hadn't switched to Coke yet, meat and potatoes, for dinner, and ice cream in the freezer. And then there was everything else that a household requires to work, of course. In 1959, Warren Buffett met Charlie Munger at a local dinner party. Munger was a Los Angeles lawyer and, book with legs. The two truly hit it off intellectually and, well, the rest is history. Munger is the vice chairman of Warren Buffett's company Berkshire Hathaway and has been since 1978. Munger challenged Buffett's beliefs about cheap companies. Prior to meeting Charlie Munger, Buffett focused on, investments in mediocre companies that traded at bargain prices. After being convinced by Munger, he instead started to focus on, great companies at fair prices. While both strategies are valid, Graham's approach is more suitable for the investor with smaller amounts of capital, while Munger's approach is more all-around. Graham, his approach, was not scalable. I mean, you could not do it with really big money. Charlie Munger helped Buffett find companies such as Seas Candies and Coca-Cola. By January 1962, Buffett had a total of 10 different partnerships, or 11 if you include the one he had with his father. These partnerships were all with different groups of people, and Buffett now decided to combine them into a single larger one, Buffett Partnership Limited. He had about $7.2 million in assets under management and his and Susie's interest in the new partnership was $1,025,000. Buffett was now a millionaire. Here's the quickest recap ever, through grinding, reading, delivering newspapers, starting businesses, learning about value investing, going to business school, working for his idol and role model, leveraging other people's money, being on the constant lookout for cheap companies to invest in, and most of all, staying completely focused the whole time. Buffett became a millionaire at age 31.